Good morning. Welcome to the fourth lecture of week three of this ongoing course on understanding and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And here we are focusing on scope one and two emission reduction through building design and construction. I am your instructor, Professor Avlokita Agrawal, Associate Professor at Department of Architecture and Planning, IIT Roorkee. In this particular lecture, we are going to continue the discussion which we were having yesterday, which was understanding the scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions and prior to that we had discussed about very briefly what 1, 2, 3 scope uh, emissions are, but we were primarily understanding how to identify and fix the organizational boundary and the operational boundary, which will tell us where to act. So, we will know exactly where to act when we understand the organizational boundary and then how to act, what exactly do we need to do is after identifying the organizational boundary that we go forward to identifying operational boundaries and understanding the specific processes and activities that take part within this boundary. And there with each activity we will know the associated emissions. Now, whether these emissions fall into scope 1, 2 or 3 is a later part, but before we do that, before we categorize these emissions into these scopes and we will understand what these scopes are, but prior to that we have to clearly know what are these emissions, where are they coming from. Now that we have already seen, so in this particular lecture we are continuing the previous discussion and going forward with understanding, defining clearly which emissions fall in scope 1, 2 and 3 and then we will also understand the challenges in addressing these different scopes. Today we will cover this much and then continuing with the same topic we will go forward to the last lecture of this week 3 where we will look at the examples of scope 1, 2 and 3 projects. So starting with understanding scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions in this lecture today. So, as I had clearly mentioned earlier also very briefly that scope 1 emissions are the direct emissions that are occurring in the processes within the boundary organizational and operational boundary of a company that is wanting to disclose the emissions. Now, why, what would that mean? What are these direct emissions? So, there are broadly four categories in which you can understand that these emissions largely in majority of the companies these scope 1 emissions will fall in these four major categories. The first one which is actually mentioned here as fourth is what I will uh, tell you first here and this is the easiest to understand. These are the process emissions. Processes for example, we have an industry, we are manufacturing any product, maybe we are manufacturing some uh, chemical products, we are processing food, we are making fabrics. So, there are some direct emissions which are occurring because of the process that is happening there, maybe mixing of chemicals, so some chemical gases are released or uh, because of processing of, of uh, food, there are certain gases that are released these are the direct process emissions which are taking place as part of the manufacturing process. This is what will come in scope 1 emission. These are directly happening within the facility which is under the direct control of this company. So, all such process emissions will come under the scope 1 emissions and this is one of the most significant part of the overall emissions 1, 2 and 3 scope uh, 1, 2 and 3 emissions. So, this process emissions form one of the most significant part of the emissions for some industries, for some companies, not all. If we do not have manufacturing, for example, if it is just a service provider company, there the process emissions might be significantly low, there the scope 3 might go higher which we, we will come to. So, these are process emissions very simple to understand very simple to identify also which are happening there and as part of the process of manufacturing is what we are talking uh, covering within this process emissions, industrial processes. Other than these, uh, this process emission there are three categories again significant ones which contribute to direct emissions. First one is stationary combustion, for example the fuels or heating sources. So, all the fuels which are combusted within these facilities directly for 
for anything they could be providing serving as fuel for something for example uh, there could be a small handicraft factory which is working with glass now to heat up the glass to melt the glass and to to give it a shape this continuous heating is required which is where the conventional fuel is going maybe not electricity but the conventionally coal is uh, going to be used all the emissions resulting from burning of that fuel for processes or for heating or conditioning they are going to be counted towards scope 1 emissions direct emissions and under the category stationary combustion the second one is a mobile combustion so this stationary combustion is actually taking place at a unit at a stationary unit the second one is mobile combustion which is largely coming from transportation for example we have fleet of buses which is what we were discussing in previous lectures also so we have a fleet of buses which is required which is used to bring the employees to the office now all the combustions which are taking all the emissions which are taking place because of combustion of fuel conventional fuel it could be petrol diesel cng lpg these are all coming under mobile combustion and these are scope 1 emissions direct emissions from the facility which is owned and directly controlled by the company in case we have an electric vehicle fleet so we were discussing that also if we have an electric vehicle fleet in that case we are not burning we are not burning the fuel directly at our facility or within the uh, purview of our organizational boundary in that case the electricity is being purchased from somewhere and the combustion of electricity is not causing any emissions direct emissions at our facility but where the electricity is being produced there some emissions are happening and that we will consider in scope 2 the indirect emissions but direct emissions will happen only when this fleet of transportation is running on conventional fuel so this is what and often this is a major uh, source of emission direct emissions mobile combustion most of the companies a lot of companies they have big transportation fleets there are buses and variety of cars and huge number of cars given to the employees and uh, you know their managers and executives or uh, this entire fleet when owned and controlled by the company will come under the mobile combust combustion now the fourth one which we are looking at here is the fugitive emission and these are the leaks from greenhouse gases for example there is a cold storage now th there could be a company which owns a large number of cold storages and how are cold storages uh, maintained at a certain degree uh, temperature it is with the help of a very uh, elaborate system of refrigeration cooling chilling now that requires certain refrigerants which are again greenhouse gases they have very high uh, global warming potential we've already seen that so now these gases when they are inside they are inside a closed loop but there are chances that they might get leaked often at home also you might have uh, observed the cases where your air conditioner the gas from air conditioner leaks and the air conditioner stops working okay one we are consuming electricity to run that air conditioner which is coming from somewhere that is one type of emission going into scope 2 but the gas that has leaked whatever small amount of ga gas it was it has already leaked to the environment it has been emitted in the environment and when that gas leaked the emission that is happening because of that leak is coming into the purview of this fugitive emission and right now when you are at your home where you are directly observing we have very uh, limited amount of uh, limited number of uh, these equipment which are consuming or which are having these refrigerants or gases uh, which can be categorized as greenhouse gases but when we are talking about industrial units when we are talking about manufacturing plants bigger units there we might have processes which involve using these refrigerants and these greenhouse gases in a very large quantity there a small amount of leak implies a significant amount of emission and how do we know that how would companies know that the gas has leaked because there is a certain pressure that has to be maintained 
and we know the total volume. So, the process is and in the maintenance process to continue to run the plant at a certain efficiency, these pressures and the volume of the gas that is uh, inside the system in a closed loop is constantly monitored and we need to refill the gas. The amount of gas refill which is being done is also the amount of gas which has already leaked into the environment. All these emissions will be covered under the fugitive emission. Now, when I am saying that when we are discussing about reporting these emissions direct emissions as a company, I want to calculate, I want to measure, calculate and then report the emissions whether they be scope 1, 2 or 3. We have to always remember the 5 principles GHG protocol bases itself on and one of that would become here as transparency. How transparent we are in reporting? Now, as a facility if I am not very careful as an industry if I am not very careful about how the gases are leaking out of my, my closed loops and my closed systems that and if I am transparently reporting that would also tell the world about the carelessness of a company probably. Now, here when a company chooses to uh, make public its emissions to declare its emissions, it also has to go back and check its processes and that is what the intent of GAG protocol is. That when we have to report something, we will be more careful, we will be more cautious that such emissions are not happening and we will gradually work towards reducing these emissions. So, transparency is required if we really want to make this uh, the following of GAG protocol successful. The protocol as a document is a well uh, made uh, document, but the whole point is in successful implementation of it and it can only be successfully implemented if we have we are following the principles of GAG protocol. So, this is what scope 1 emission is the direct emissions uh, resulting directly emitting from the company owned and controlled resources only. Then we move to the scope 2 indirect emissions which are resulting from the owned resources again. So, direct emissions are also from the resources which are controlled and owned by the company. Scope 2 emissions which are indirect emissions are also from the company owned. So, what we have broadly there are two categories one the purchased electricity and the other one the purchased heating and cooling. So, there is no direct emission which is happening at the facility within the organizational and operational boundary of the company. It is emission which is happening somewhere, but because of the activity which is happening within my organizational boundary. So, for example, when I say electricity, purchase of electricity. So, I might be having uh, for example, a garment factory. Now, in my garment factory everything all the machines are running on electricity, all the stitching, all the weaving, everything is uh, happening uh, on machines which are running on electricity. Now, there might not be direct emissions resulting from the process, the manufacturing process of this garment, but the machines which are running on electricity, this electricity is actually being produced somewhere. We are using a cleaner fuel but the emissions which are happening when the electricity is being produced is accrued to my credit, my company's credit because I am using that electricity. These are indirect emissions. Now, the emission factor would change from country to country, from region to region. Usually in a country and we had discussed this in earlier lectures also, usually within a country we keep the emission factor as the same. When we are talking about purchasing electricity and calculating emissions from it. So, how do we do that? It is a very simple process, but the background study that is a detailed study. So, electricity is still across the world being produced largely from conventional sources. Either it is produced from coal by burning coal, thermal power plants or gas. A significant portion and which is growing is also coming from the renewable sources of energy. For example, solar wind, biomass. Now, all these have different emission factors. So, depending upon the percentage of the total electricity that is coming. Now, we are talking about nation at large. So, 
For example, 100 percent of the electricity that is being produced in a, in a country, we will actually look at what percentage is coming from coal because when the electricity is produced from coal, it has a different emission factor. The gases which are going to be released to the environment are higher in the case of conventional fuels while they are lower. But percentage wise we will put all of that in the formula and get an average emission factor for per unit of electricity consumed. Now, when we produce electricity, so approximately 3 units of electricity produced will actually be equivalent to 1 or 1 and a half uh, unit of electricity consumed at the consumer end. A lot of transportation distribution losses are there in when we are consuming electricity that is also accounted for. So, we are taking into account the transmission and distribution losses of electricity. So, one unit consumed here at the consumer end would probably mean two units produced and for the, those two units produced we will actually be looking at the emissions which are happening because of different types of fuels that are being consumed. But all these are indirect emissions which are not happening within my organizational boundary, but the electricity that is consumed within my organizational boundary comes with an emission factor which is my indirect emission. And the same is for heating and cooling. In India, we might not have seen the central uh, heating or district heating and cooling, but in uh, especially in colder countries where we have central facilities, district heating and cooling facilities where heating and cooling could be purchased or maybe a very large facility where they have a central heating and cooling uh, facility and it supplies heating and cooling. There again we will look at the emission factor which is associated with the heating and cooling in turn. For example, if the, if the heating is being provided by burning the conventional fuel centrally in the district, there the units of heating that have been purchased depending upon the efficiency or your requirement will again be multiplied with an emission factor depending upon the fuel that is used to produce the heating or to enable cooling. So, this is what we are talking about in scope 2 direct indirect emissions, but only from the owned facilities which are so here which is directly consumed, but the emissions are produced somewhere. This is under indirect emissions. Now, you might be thinking that a company, the processes, they release far more emissions, you know, there are so many processes that uh, uh, emit greenhouse gas uh, gases, where do they go? They go, the remaining indirect emissions, they go in scope 3 emissions, which are from resources which are not owned by the company, which are not within my organizational boundary, but I am taking the products, the manufactured goods as raw materials into my industry. For example, again giving you uh, an example of uh, say a garment factory or maybe a food processing factory. Now, here in my factory, I might be processing food. For example, I might be making bread. Now, the raw material for that bread is wheat, wheat flour which is coming from somewhere, it might be uh, milk which is coming from somewhere or oil which is coming from somewhere. Now, that is not happening here. The production of that production and processing of that raw material for example, wheat flour, it is happening at some other facility. The direct emissions from that facility will be partly counted into the indirect emissions of not owned resources here. So, we are talking about the entire value chain. Now, this is one of the most debated and argued scope, scope 3 indirect emissions that how much of those indirect emissions be counted in my, my scope, in, in my uh, kitty. That is where we are having still a lot of discussion and a lot of clarity is still needed, discussions, more discussions are needed. But if I have to put it simply, if all companies across the world take care of their scope 1 and scope 2 emissions, which is direct emission, which is going into the manufacturing process also. So, all the emissions which are resulting from the manufacturing process and all the direct uh, emissions plus the indirect emissions from my own resources, they are 
eventually going to become scope 3 for somebody else, some other company. So, if I am able to handle my scope 1 and 2 and every other company is able to reduce their scope 1 and 2 emissions together collectively we will actually be addressing the scope 3 because the pro product which is being manufactured here is either upstream or downstream value chain part of upstream or downstream value chain for some other company. So, it will be adding to the scope 3 of somebody. So, that is where currently we have agreed. So, we clearly know that GAG protocol is not a mandatory uh, protocol as of now, it is still in voluntary uh, stage. So, the world has kind of agreed to first look at scope 1 and 2 emissions and then gradually move on to the scope 3 emissions. But what all would this scope 3 cover? Scope 3 would cover the emissions which are resulting from the extraction and production of purchased materials and fuels. Now, we, we will be talking about building uh, materials, uh, building design and construction. Now, when we say building construction, there are materials that are going into it and the choice of materials will impact my scope 3 emissions. So, while the emissions are not happening on my site, it, they are happening indirectly at somebody else's site, but my choice of selection of materials will determine what the scope 3 indirect emissions at not owned resources will be. For example, if I have to make a wall, now I have the option of making the uh, blocks as a CSCB compressed and stabilized earth blocks which require no firing, no fuel is required, very uh, minimal amount of uh, stabilizer which might be cement which uh, that might be added and the clay, the mud that is procured from the site itself. Now, the emissions which are associated with the CSEB and compare that with an autoclaved aerated concrete block, AAC block. Now, there the emissions which is the AAC block is completely made out of uh, cement. So, if we compare the emissions of these two blocks, none of this is going to be manufactured on my site. They might be giving me similar thermal performance, so that my operational energy is the same, but the embodied energy which is associated with these two products, two different products will result in, will give me the scope 3 emissions that my company will also be declaring. So, the choice of material, what we have, the entire value chain and the choices that I have through my entire value chain will determine these indirect emissions. So, we are talking about the extraction and production of purchased materials and fuels, then we are talking about transport related activities. So, it could be transportation of goods, materials, it could be transportation of purchased fuels also. So, fuel itself has to be uh, transported, there could be travels for uh, employees, for business purposes, for commuting from to and from, uh, from work. For example, now, for this particular point, if you remember, we did discuss about what if I do not own and I rent a facility. So, I may be subletting the work to somebody else, a third party who will be responsible for providing the transportation services for my employees, bringing them from uh, home to work and back. Now, in that case, neither is a direct emission because I do not own that fleet nor is it indirect emission because I do not have an EV or uh, anything like that. Now, where does it go? But it is still part of my broader boundary, it is part of my value chain. So, the third party which is providing the service to me though, so it is just on rent, but the emissions, the direct emissions resulting from that third party is also going to accrue here under my scope 3 indirect emissions, that is what we are talking about transportation of sold products, transportation of waste, so all the transport related activities which are leased, which are not directly under the control of the company, they will all be added to scope 3 emissions. This is part of the value chain, both upstream downstream. And the third one is electricity related activities which are not included in scope 2. For example, if we have the electricity which is required in extraction, production and transportation of the fuels which are consumed in generation of electricity. So, generation of electricity plus in scope 3 we will also be looking at 
the extraction, production and transportation of the fuel which is going in producing electricity. So, scope 3 is really wide because we are ideally we should be making it as comprehensive as possible covering all the possible emissions that might be taking place. We will also be talking about generation of electricity that is consumed and reported by the end user. So, that is also coming in your in your scope 3 activities. These are electricities, electricity related activities not included in scope 2 which is part of this scope 3. We also have indirect emissions or scope 3 emissions resulting from leased assets, franchisees, outsourced activities. So, very large multinational companies they will not always have uh, assets which are owned. They could be leased assets or they could be franchisee assets. So, scope 3 emissions would cover these emissions resulting from the leased or franchisee uh, units. They will also be accrued to the to the bigger uh, company. We will see some of the examples. There are some very interesting examples uh, coming from companies which are working hard to understand where these scope 3 emissions are. Then use of sold products and services is also part of the indirect emissions. So, the kind of product that we are making it is being sold and how it is being used where it is being used is also going to bring us some scope 3 emissions. The waste disposal if we produce a lot of waste and how that waste is going to be disposed. So, for example, there is a company which is only dealing with uh, with disposal of waste or processing of waste, but the waste is actually coming from 100 different units. So, this company which is only treating disposing the waste cannot be held responsible for causing the, the emissions. These emissions will actually go into the credit of the companies which have produced the waste. So, scope 3 emissions will also be going coming from disposal of waste. Now, this waste could be generated as part of the operations or as part of the manufacturing and uh, production or uh, any other thing. But all the emissions resulting from waste disposal and processing they will also be uh, counted in the scope 3 emissions. So, if we kind of put it all together to just reiterate scope 1 we are talking about direct emissions generated by the company facilities and vehicles. Here we are talking about all the processes all the industrial units are going to be part of the scope 1 emission. The scope 2 emission is the indirect emission produced as a result of the purchase of electricity, heating or cooling for an organization's use. So, we are not talking of the industrial processes here, we are only talking of the emissions which are, which are resulting because of the production of electricity. So, we are talking about thermal power plants or you know any other plant, it could be uh, solar plant or wind farm or anything, but the emissions that are taking place because of the production of electricity are here. The scope 3 is a very wide scope and also varied scope. So, all the upstream which is suppliers and downstream which is customers and distributors all the activities that are there starting from extraction of raw material to the disposal of the finally used product is all coming in scope 3. Now, that is a very large scope which we are talking about and as I said again earlier I am reiterating that currently the focus of majority of the companies across the world because it is a voluntary uh, activity it is a voluntary commitment is largely on scope 1 and scope 2 to start with gradually we will be moving to scope 3 and scope 3 to immediately address the companies are looking at the alternatives that are available to them and the choices that they can make in selecting the raw material or the processes or the decisions that can be made upstream and downstream of the value chain. So, this is what scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions would be. Now, we have these 3 scopes, but we also have the 6 categories approach. So, here aligning with the ISO 14064 the we have broken down the three scopes into six categories. So, I will take you to these six categories. So, the scope 1 will have directly the category 1 where we are directly talking about direct GHG emissions and removals that is simple which is what we have seen also fuel use, refrigerant leakages, 
direct uh, emissions and removals from land use. So, agriculture, forestry are all uh, you know they are coming into this part. So, scope 1 and category 1. Scope 2 all the emissions of scope 2 fall into this category 2 where we are talking about indirect GHG emissions from imported energy. So, basically purchased energy and its production elsewhere is what is going into category 2. Scope 1 and scope 2 are directly coming into category 1 and category 2 which is simple. Now, scope 3 has been divided into further 4 more categories here. So, what we have here is category 3 where we are talking about indirect GHG emissions from transportation. So, all the business travel, staff commute, freight transport. So, we have seen all the indirect uh, greenhouse gas emissions resulting from transportation of goods, of people, of services is going to come into this category 3 which is going into our scope 3. So, very clearly if we have to see what all will come under scope 3, we can divide it into different categories and then know that which category should go where. So, this is category 3. Category 4 is indirect GHG emissions from products and organization uses. For example, the materials as I was mentioning. So, what material are we using? What is the choice of uh, our uh, material that is going to be used? For example, if we have a restaurant. Now, the kind of food products that are that are going to be used whether we are using more raw, uh, raw products or we are using more processed products that choice itself will be coming under this category 4 emissions. So, the emissions which are resulting from materials and waste that are generated through leased assets working from home. So, if people are working from home and the offices are not working even then the scope 3 emissions which are emitting from home because of the employee working from home will also be going into this category 4. So, this is what we are covering as part of category 4 and the electricity T and D losses the transmission and distribution losses they are put into this category 4. So, direct production the emissions resulting from direct production will go into scope 2 category 2 while the T and D losses will go into category 4 scope 3. Then we have category 5 where we are looking at indirect GHG emissions from the use of products from the organization. For example, end of life stage emissions. So, what happens after the product has completed its, uh, its life and it has to be uh, decomposed, it has to be either recycled. So, end of life stage emissions, downstream franchisees, the leased assets. So, they are going to come from uh, come to category 5. Emissions from investments. So, uh, here we are largely looking at the financial institutions. So, the financial institutions may not be generating any direct or indirect emissions uh, as such, but the where they have invested the kind of products, uh, projects and products they have invested in will also bring them the category 5 emissions which will be covered in the scope 3. And the last, last category, category 6 is from all other sources. So, specific emissions or removals which cannot be recorded in any other manner they have been put in category 6. So, this scope 3 has been further divided into 4 categories for ease of understanding and yet there are several forms of emissions, several sources of emissions which cannot be covered in some of these categories and that is why we clearly made this category category 6. Once we have understood this, we have to and by this time you would have already understood that there are so many challenges in understanding the uh, and addressing the different scopes. Now, scope 1 and scope 2 comparatively are direct and they can be easily addressed because there is a clarity of what goes where. But when we talk about the scope 3, there we will have slight uh, difficulty a challenge in first understanding that what is going where, what is going to be the scope 3 part. But once we have done that and even while we are doing that, we have a lot of problem in actually measuring the, uh, the emissions. For example, a lot of organization, majority of organizations they know of their direct emissions, but they do not know how what their vendors or suppliers are doing. So, upstream and downstream what the the suppliers, what the uh, uh, vendors are, how they are producing their goods. 
So, their emissions might not be known to me and there is also uh, a lot of times the smaller vendors, the smaller manufacturing facilities may also not have the necessary expertise and also the, uh, the funding available to them for recording measuring the emissions for making a, a proper uh, a measurement and verification uh, to follow a protocol like that. So, there we might have missing links in between the, the value chain and especially it is happening in the scope 3. Scope 1 and 2 which are directly under the control of the company could be easily measured and verified also, but the entire value chain the scope 3 might be difficult and it is often difficult to check that. So, that is the first but most significant challenge of measuring and verifying the emissions. The second is the need for data exchange that raises concerns about trust, confidentiality and privacy. The issue is most prominent for the upstream supply chain actors who must maintain trade secrets. So, now that is where I was talking about the principle of transparency and other principles also come into play. Now, at one point of time we want to you know declare the emissions and along with that when we declare emissions we are also declaring the, the processes that we are going through a lot of trade secrets. On one side we want transparency on the other side it might be a business requirement the trade secret has to be maintained. Now, where that balance has to come that is a challenge sometimes we want to declare and the other times the business uh, requirement is such that we cannot declare. So, that is uh, another challenge that is that is faced by a lot of companies which want to declare. The third is the alignment on scope 3 interventions. So, this is what I have been uh, discussing that scope 3 is really wide and there is not one party as, as a stakeholder there are multiple stakeholders through the entire value chain. Now, that might uh, there it might be difficult to bring everybody on board and align the interests and align the uh, the uh, interest towards reducing GAG emissions people might fall out and that is what we are talking uh, about this challenge where bringing everybody on board and to follow the same path might take time and it might not also happen easily. So, while scope 1 and 2 could be easier managed because there are lesser stakeholders and lesser partners going to be party to that the scope 3 might really take a lot of time. And finally, the data management systems that are usually either non-existent or they cannot be scaled up uh, with the information required for GHG accounting it is it, it has to be manually done and that might itself bring in a lot of anomalies or disruptions in the calculations and in also the, uh, the procuring and assimilation of the data. So, we are talking about huge data sets here because we are talking about the entire value chain when we are talking about scope 1, 2 or 3 emission all put together. So, there data management itself could be a challenge that from where all the data is coming and how the data is getting assimilated, where the emissions are going to accrue and to whom and in what percentage. So, that data management itself could be a very big challenge. So, if we look at most of the challenges, we will see that scope 1 and 2 are still easier done and understood while scope 3 would require some more time for the industry to grow and develop in this uh, direction of accounting and also reporting the GHG emissions. So, if we look at the key challenges and kind of summarize them, it is about inaccessibility of information in uh, a lot of cases where measurement and verification is not being done regularly, confidentiality concerns, need for alignment with diverse suppliers. So, bringing everybody on board and following the same path, unscalability of data management systems and lack of reporting standards and regulations. So, we still do not in large number of countries we still do not have data reporting and data reporting standards and regulations. If they were in place a lot, lot of data would be easily available with, uh, with the entire value chain vendors and customers, but majority of the times there is this lack of regulation and standards for reporting and which is why data is not available. All these three are making currently the scope 3 emission reporting as a little challenging task, but still a lot can be done and gradually we are making progress. So, as we said 
there are no regulated scope 3 emission matrix or there is no mandate. So, the companies the organizations they have their own targets and they also have their own measurement sets and that is where the standards regulations and protocols are required. So, that some proper uh, standardization mechanism for reporting and also measuring is, is uh, put in place. So, that is all in the lecture today we will look at some of the examples of how different companies have measured and declared their emissions and how have they overcome these challenges which we have we have identified or if they have really been able to overcome the challenges we will see through the examples of scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions as reported by different companies so far. So, thank you very much for joining me today we will meet for the last lecture of this week tomorrow. Thank you, bye bye.